All right. Well, thank you for thank you for joining us, Lisa Clark, on the podcast. Um, it's been it's been great working with you and getting to know you over the years. Um, and just by way of background, um, uh, Lisa, I know you've been on the board with uh, DMC from the beginning, um, even in its formative years, dating to the early 2010s. And uh, you've been economic, or sorry, executive director of the DMC Economic Development Agency since 2014, correct? Correct, yes. Yes, I've been with DMC quite a few years from the very beginning, Brian, and now I am the executive director of Destination Medical Center Economic Development Agency. Okay. And um, I wonder if you could maybe explain to people who aren't familiar with your role, just kind of, kind of what your duties have been and, and sort of what your focus has been in that role through the years. Sure, happy to. So uh, Destination Medical Center started not with that name, I might add. Um, it started in about 2010. Uh, years ago, when we really talked about Mayo Clinic, wanting to make sure it remains as the premier destination center uh, for healthcare in the world. And to do that, we had a board meeting at Mayo Clinic and we talked a lot about the community and how these two groups need to work to, together to create this experience in Rochester like none other. And we found that there were quite a few gaps. And so we, true to Mayo's nature, we embarked on a big research endeavor for probably almost two years before we even came forward to the legislation. And that really helped us understand what is needed in Rochester? Where are the gaps? And we click, quickly learned that um, Rochester's tax base alone can't support the kind of growth that we wanted to happen in Rochester, Minnesota, and of course for the state of Minnesota. And so, hence, DMC was born. Yeah. Um, and what what attracted you to this opportunity in the first place to be involved with uh, DMC and um, in its formative years and beyond? It was a little bit of, of two things. One, it was um, being at the right place at the right time. So I was involved with Mayo Clinic at the time, doing a lot of public affairs, community relations, directing some of their public affairs department and working with Mayo Clinic leaders. And at the same time, I was working with a lot of the community leaders as well. And these, two, these were the two groups that really needed to come together. And then of course, personal interest. I've always been a big, um, fan of business and how does business function. And I've always been a, a person who wonders where the gaps are. And I work best probably in the seams, if you will, of trying to bring two entities together or two initiatives together. Or I work on the fringes best where you can do a lot of great work. And so I was really fortunate to come forward and be asked to provide leadership to this initiative first as it came through the legislative session which was a very big lift. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, secondly, of course, be being asked to lead the, uh, the economic development company. Okay. And I wonder if you could reflect on the success of the legislature in 2013, I believe it was 2000, to, to get the, the funding um, for the DMC initiative. Um, you've talked about how that was a big moment for you and your team, obviously. And, and I know it wasn't, it wasn't easy to get that accomplished. I know just looking back at a 2013 story in Finance and Commerce, we wrote, recent developments suggest that it will be an uphill battle to secure more than $550 million in state funding for Mayo's ambitious $6 billion project in Rochester. And of course, one of the main concerns was the price tag. Um, and how were you able to convince lawmakers that it was worth the price? Well, um, it was a big lift and you know this, everybody knows this, you can't do it without an amazing team. And we had a wonderful team. And of course we had a wonderful base called Mayo Clinic. And I think that was the big impetus, meaning the state of Minnesota understands that Mayo Clinic is a big provider in terms of economic development amongst many other things to the state of Minnesota. And everybody has a story, Brian, about Mayo Clinic and so do the legislators. And I say hats off to the legislators for understanding what our true mission and vision was in Rochester and Mayo Clinic and understanding that we wanna keep that 
wonderful gem in this community and in the state of Minnesota. So our big lift was, of course, helping people understand the value and where the gaps were and why we needed this um, assistance, if you will, this public, these public dollars to help us bring even a bigger effort into Minnesota, Minnesota as a whole. So we marched through that state of Minnesota, helping people, not just in the Twin Cities, not just the legislators, but gaining advocacy around the state of Minnesota for um, why this is a big, uh, an initiative that people would want to support and how it helps everybody. And you can imagine something of that nature. Um, some people were questioning it. Some people were wondering what's in it for me. And so we had to really help to state that case. And again, Mayo Clinic's value speaks for itself oftentimes, but one of the things that I learned very quickly was that even though Rochester is only 90 miles south of the Twin Cities, or perhaps shorter now, um, people really didn't understand Mayo's benefit and what it brought to the state of Minnesota. They didn't understand that it's 12, $13 billion of economic impact to the state of Minnesota. They didn't understand that Mayo Clinic in Rochester has 36,000 employees. Um, I used to do my own little taste, my own little test at the legislation. And when I would say, um, how many people do you think work at Mayo Clinic in Rochester? And most of the answer was 5,000. And then I would say, well, actually it's 36,000. And people, you know, some light bulbs went off for people, even though people know Mayo and that it's a great value to the state. I don't think they really knew the depth and breadth of Mayo and, and what it does for the entire state of Minnesota, not just Rochester. So we put a team together, we developed a case for change, we did a lot of research, we found out where the gaps were for patients, visitors, travelers, people who live and work in Rochester, and then we brought forward a really solid economic development plan that not only our state legislators um, approved and endorsed, but also one that people from all over the country now are calling me saying, how did you guys do that? And could we apply this in our own state or our own city? Which I think is great value. It's a, it's a value add. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, can you talk a little bit about some of the big um, highlights or accomplishments that you've seen uh, at, at the MC? The, uh, we've written before about, uh, uh, you know, a billion dollars in development projects since 2014, um, 7,700 new jobs um, added, uh, 1,000 new downtown housing units. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? And, you know, what it means to see that kind of investment? Definitely. Um, Rochester's goal, or DMC's goal, of course, is to bring 30,000 new jobs to Rochester, Minnesota over 20 years. So DMC is a 20-year initiative. Um, we also believe that we'll bring five to six billion dollars of new investment into Rochester. And again, that's over 20 years. And then um, the state gave the nod for the $585 million of, of public support. And the, the really interesting thing about the model is that it's a private dollars go in first, public dollars follow. So I think people sometimes have uh, are misinformed or have an idea that all the money has been transferred to Rochester at one time. And actually the money is just starting to flow right now from the state of Minnesota. So it's, we had to prove $200 million of investment before even a nickel dropped from the state. And now that model is flowing. So the more public private investment we put in the ground, the more um, public investment follows. And so the model is working and it's a really interesting economic development model that I've been sharing across the country because it's it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense and it's less risk, if you will, for the state. So what we've done over the last five years, and interesting that you're asking this now, Brian, because this is our five-year update. So in the law, we said that every five years we need to update the DMC plan, which makes a ton of sense because um, many of us have been involved in planning either city plans or other business plans where we think it's a great plan and it goes up on a shelf, never to be looked at again until somebody dusts it off 10 years later and go, didn't we do a plan somewhere? And so I think that this is um, this every five year stopping point is really been wonderful for us. So on the DMC team, 
which is an amazing team, um, we've put together a look back, like what are the successes in the first five years? And we are so proud, Brian, of the first five years in DMC. As you said, we brought in about a billion dollars of private investment, so we're on track there. Um, 7,700 new jobs, we're on track there. Um, we've built hotels, we've built um, quite a bit of residential, and we all know that any downtown, any strong downtown, a vibrant downtown, needs people who live downtown, that create that energy. And Rochester had very, very little downtown um, housing. And so we've brought in about a thousand new units of housing downtown. Um, we built the first bioscience life science building. Uh, we've got a Mortensen partner who is actually building a research bioscience life science campus downtown Rochester. And of course the value for that is that we have Mayo Clinic as a partner. Their, their downtown, their whole campus or much of their campus is downtown Rochester. And we looked across the United States to find out what works in bioscience, life science campuses, and a lot of, lot of states, a lot of cities want to be that center, but where better to do it than in Rochester because of Mayo Clinic. And so we built um, what we call One Discovery Square. This is a 16 block area. Our first building is called One Discovery Square, and that building actually is leased up. It's about leased up about two years earlier than we thought, and we're breaking ground um, probably within the next couple of weeks for the second bioscience life science technology building. So that's going to bring new jobs. That's going to bring new businesses that have never seen Rochester before and have never certainly seen Minnesota before to this great state and this city. And that, of course, is the economic generator. The other thing that we've been doing a lot of work on is public realm particularly with COVID right now, we're continuing our public realm projects because that's the time to get in the ground for public realm and keep um, that type of work going. We've got Heart of the City going, which is where Rochester hospitality meets healthcare. And that's the vibrant downtown area with shopping and business and healthcare. So we're continuing the public realm. And then the final thing I'll just mention um, is transportation. We are just um, in the queue right now for hopeful federal funding so that we can start our transportation uh, new BRT route through downtown from the outside of, of Rochester through downtown, which will help transport patients, it'll transport employees, it'll transport people who live and work in Rochester. That's a big deal for Rochester because we've been a very, very car centric city. And so we need to shift those modes and this is one way to do that. So we have put a lot of time and money into that as well. So we feel like we are on a path for success for DMC. We've sort of blown through many of the initial goals that we had um, had set for DMC. We started, Brian, in a moment or in a position of strength because we weren't a city that was tanking. We were actually a strong city and we wanted to become stronger. Um, and now we have, of course, amped that up a bit, and we are now in a, in a position of strength. And thank goodness, because we've got COVID landed in our front yard, just like everybody else's. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about the impact of COVID? And it's interesting, the timeline we're talking about here, because this thing just is getting started, or at least the planning, you know, not, you know, when we were still kind of struggling to get out of the Great Recession, and now we've been whacked by COVID. And um, how much of an impact has that had? Yeah, isn't timing everything? Like, you're right, we started our DMC right after the recession, and we got our first five strong years in, in between, and now COVID landed. And it will impact Rochester, just like every other city. Um, you know, every city is dealing with this, but not every city is being as proactive, I think, as Rochester is. I mean, I've been looking across the country, certainly across the state, and some cities are doing some great work, and some cities, um, I think, should really think about how they want to be proactive and position their city during this, this time, during this time of pandemic. We all know that we have hesitant uh, consumers. Um, Rochester is no different. I mean, people just don't know when it's safe to get out there and when, when, um, you know, when they feel as though all the organizations and the businesses are safe and the restaurants. And so this will affect us. It will just, 
as I said, just like every other city, it will affect us. And we are now positioning ourselves, meaning Rochester and all of the organizations in Rochester to do quite a few things. Um, we're trying to make sure that we are prepared for repurposing potential um, vacancies. So as some of the small businesses are starting to go away, unfortunately, I mean, every morning I wake up and I hope for the businesses and I hope they're doing, you know, they can stay afloat and some of them can't. And so how will we take that real estate, that commercial real estate and repurpose that? So we're starting to have those discussions right now. I mean, what, what are the best ways in which we can do just that? A couple of other things that we're doing, um, we're doing a lot on the monetary side, meaning we are partnering with other organizations to provide as many funds and grants and um, any dollars available for particularly small businesses so that we can help them get through this really, really tough and gritty time because everybody's going to need every dollar they can to help with that. In, and we are providing jobs in the community continuing. So the great thing about Rochester is, yes, it will be affected. We perhaps may be affected a bit less for two reasons. One, we have Mayo Clinic um, and those patients are coming back. If people need health care. And two, we have these DMC tools that we're continuing to use. And so we feel very blessed that we've got projects that are continuing to move forward. Uh, some of those I mentioned, particularly the Discovery Square 2 project, which is a big, big initiative. I mean, it's hard to build those buildings anyway. It's hard to big, build bioscience research technology buildings because they're really costly to do but we feel very fortunate and we actually feel very confident that we will fill those buildings. So we're working with all the community partners to do the best that we can to really help businesses and to help this community get through this tough time. Yeah, and uh, well, there's certainly five, the first five years are promising, but there's still a ways to go. What do you see next? Um, just kind of continue to build off the successes that you've seen. Um, we will. We will do that, Brian. I think diversification is really important for us. We need to continue to diversify our economy. I mean, Mayo Clinic is one mammoth healthcare economy in Rochester, Minnesota, thank goodness. And um, as I said before, they provide jobs to a lot of people, but those things are shifting now, like other cities as well. I mean, how many people are going to be staying home um, and do remote uh, um working and that will affect us that will affect our downtown and we need to make sure that we continue to focus on our downtown it's sort of our golden goose if you will and we need to keep feeding it and so to do that we are going to have to repurpose things and keep uh, the public infrastructure happening so this heart of the city project i talked about and we've got a project called discovery discovery walk which is a linear parkway that's trying to connect all of these sub districts in rochester to create more of a people friendly uh, pedestrian friendly environment and so we will continue the projects where we can because it brings jobs to this community i mean it brings hundreds of construction jobs in this community and it keeps our economy going and so Things like that are really important for us that we continue to invest in that infrastructure. We continue to invest in public realm. We continue to move forward on diversifying the economy with this bioscience, life science campus and really focus on our small businesses and our local businesses so that they stay with us because I do believe we will come out of this. It's gonna look different. Mm -hmm. Businesses have to change. We've seen it a lot. Um, and it's been really fun, Brian, to see, um, I think it's been really interesting to see how innovative businesses can be. There's a lot of businesses right now that just took this time to make the pivot, to change their business model, to get online, to open up in terms of outdoor seating, to think about um, delivery, food delivery, to um, offer different products and different services than they ever have or we've seen businesses partner. Businesses that never would partner before have now started to partner to say, you guys do X, we do Y, let's do it together and be stronger. And that's why I think the economy will, everything's gonna change. Nothing's gonna be the same it was as it was, but I think smart business people have already leapfrogged to the future 
and are really thinking about how they can be strong for the future. Yeah, it's been been a. I think that's been an outcome of uh, this pandemic that people, I certainly didn't realize. Everybody's doing things different or faster. You know, maybe even Mayo Clinic they've done some things differently about virtual care um, that they weren't quite ready to do, um, and they just they leapt right to the future because that's what people were asking for and that's what we were needing at this time. So we might have all gotten to the future a lot faster than we thought. Well, yeah, that's a good observation. One thing I've been hearing is this pandemic is just expediting some of the trends that maybe were happening in the first place or would eventually happen, um, whether it's working at home or different things like uh, you mentioned with Mayo. Um, so interesting times we're living in, certainly. Um, what's what I understand now, of course, you announced uh, recently um, your upcoming retirement, and I believe you're on through the end of the year. Is, is that right? I uh, am right. What will you be retiring? Be uh, yeah, I'll be I'll be retiring January fourth. Okay. And um, was your question, what are you going to do when you retire? Well, I'm just kind of curious what you'll be doing between now and then. Um, I know you'll be handing off the baton to uh, Patrick Sieb, so it'll be in good hands there, but uh, kind of what what uh, what are you focusing on now in your last couple months on the job? It's a great question. I, you know, I, when I announced it, I had about five months and I thought, oh, it's a long time. I'm, you know, to, to get ready for retirement and to get the team ready in terms of transition. And actually it just flies by, you know, all of a sudden I've got a month or two left and off I go. I feel so confident in the team. I could never, you know, you don't want to step away until you know that the things that you meant to do are finished. And for me, I meant to bring this organization forward. Yeah, I wanted it to be strong. I wanted it to be sustainable, sustainable, and I wanted it to have the right talent in place. And I feel so good about all of that. And also um, landing in a position of strength over these last five years. So we've done such great work as a team. Right now I'm working um, mostly on the five-year update, making sure that we button that up before we get to our final board meeting, which is in November, and making sure that we have a really strong, solid base, which we do, and a strong vision for the, for the future, including COVID and the, and the impact of COVID. So we made sure that that was part of our five-year plan. We didn't put our heads in the sand. We just stood up and we said, we are going to we are going to move forward and we are going to um, we're going to we're going to be innovative and creative and help where we can to keep this economy going strong. Um, big transition plan right now with Patrick as my successor. Um, he's going to be amazing. He's already been an amazing business partner and he's ready to take it to the next step, which is always great. And I always believe that my husband's been retired for two years. And so he's doing such a good job of it that it's my turn to join him. We always said we wanted to retire when we have energy and when we're healthy. And we are blessed with both of those. And so it's a great time to uh, be off and running on the retirement world. Defining that is will be most interesting, I think. I will always be an advocate and an ambassador of Minnesota and of Rochester and of DMC, of course. And so, you know, people... Um, people have tapped on my door a little bit already asking if there's something they can glean from me or some uh, time or energy in the future. And I'm happy to explore all of that, but I think I have to pause a little bit and figure out what the new world of retirement looks like for me. Great. Well, thank you again for your time and best wishes in retirement. Really. Uh, thank you, Brian. Yeah. So uh, it'll be I really appreciate it. Yeah. Finance and Commerce has been a good partner for us, and I always have appreciated the work that you all do. And um, I really, I, I feel like you've been uh, really good uh, collaborators and partners with us. And uh, so I thank you for that as well. Well, good. Well, well, it's nice to hear that. And um, uh, thank you for all your uh, for being available and and always uh, for the good work you do. So appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right. Thanks Take so care. Much. Yep. Take care, Lisa. You too. Thank you. Thanks.